on 21st June 2022, at around 6.27 UTC time, there were hundreds of websites across the internet that just suddenly went down and offline, right? And this happened across the globe. Uh, there were popular sites and services like Discord, Canva, StreamYard, Shopify, Twitter, AWS services, Google services, and so much more. The funny thing is, all of this was courtesy of a single line of code, just one line of code. So in this video, I'm going to tell you the story of what actually happened and what are some of the things that we can actually learn from this incident. So in order to understand this outage, I wanna introduce you to a company and a service called Cloudflare, right? Cloudflare is the company behind this outage. And uh, it's important to understand what exactly it is and why it's needed. So I'm gonna tell you three facts, right? Three things that you should know to understand why something like Cloudflare even exists. Fact number one, storage is way cheaper than compute, okay? Storing something on the cloud is cheaper than computing or processing something on the cloud. You wanna host an HTML or CSS file, it's cheap. You wanna host an API that does some calculation on the cloud, that's not cheap. It's just the way it's always been and it's likely to be the way in the future as well, right? This is just a fact, okay? This is fact number one. Fact number two, hosting a typical website usually comprises of both storage and compute. Okay, websites usually have some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, static assets that can be stored. And they also have dynamic assets, right? Dynamic APIs that need to be computed. There are exceptions, of course. There are some websites which are fully static and some websites which are just dynamic, fully compute. But a vast majority of websites is a combination of storage and compute, right? The cheap and the expensive. This is fact number two. Fact number three, when you use a website, right? The performance that you get off that website is dependent on where the website is hosted and where you are located, okay? If you're close, geographically close to the hosted location of the website, your performance is going to be much better than if you are several countries or continents away from where that website is hosted, right? This is fact number three. These are three facts which are kind of well-known and universal, but if you put these three facts together, a website consists of static and dynamic assets, right? Dynamic assets are costly, compute is costly, so you cannot spread them all over the world. But since hosting static assets is cheaper, you can host them in multiple locations, right? You can mul in multiple locations all over the globe. So people all over the world can get a fast performance and a better experience for at least the static part of the websites because it's dependent on the geography, right? How far or how close is that hosted server, the hosted location from the user? So this is basically the concept behind content delivery networks or CDNs, right? This is what a CDN does. It caches static assets like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that do not require any dynamic computation, okay? And it spreads them across data centers all over the world. This is actually the service that Cloudflare provides, right? Cloudflare is a company that gives you CDN services. You want to host a website, you can give Cloudflare your static assets, right? Your JS and CSS files. And Cloudflare makes sure that th those assets are distributed all over the world, all over its data centers around the world, so that those assets load faster from a possibly nearer data center uh, than hit the actual origin when somebody's making a request, right? So this is what Cloudflare does. Cloudflare actually does a, a, a whole lot more, I should say. And in, in addition to CDN, it does things like da, you know DDoS prevention, it has enhanced security and availability and all that. But that's besides the point for this discussion. For this discussion, Cloudflare is a CDN, or right? it's a content delivery network. So this is Cloudflare. And a lot of websites and a lot of services use Cloudflare, as this outage seems to have indicated. Okay, so now that you understand what a CDN is and what Cloudflare is, let's talk about this specific outage. What actually happened? Uh, well, I don't work for Cloudflare, so my information from this outage comes from things that I've read online, specifically the outage report blog post that Cloudflare themselves have put. 
All right, they've put this out. It's pretty detailed and pretty transparent report that uh, I've actually linked in the description. So if you're interested, check this out after watching this video. So I do wanna give kudos to Cloudflare for this report. It's pretty detailed and again, like I said, very transparent and uh, it's pretty informative as well. All right, so what caused the outage? Now, if all that Cloudflare is doing is hosting static files, how could they mess that up, right? Well, here's the thing. Think about this model, right? In addition to hosting static files, there is one other thing that Cloudflare is doing here. Can you spot it? Well, it's not enough for Cloudflare to just have duplicate copies of static assets all over the world, right? It's, they have to do more. They have to make sure also that when you make a request for a resource, you get the data center location that's closest to you. That's essential, right? Otherwise, what's the point of a global CDN? Okay, so how does that work? How does your request go to the best path, go through the best path or the nearest or the fastest path to get to the static resource that's closest to you. How does that work? So think of the internet as a network of computers. It looks something like this, right? Well, wrong. This is a lie. The internet is not a network of computers. It's actually a network of networks. What you have behind your router is a network which connects to other networks, which connects to other networks. So when a device makes a request, it has to find its way to the right network first, okay? It has to find its way to the right network. That's the tricky part. Once it finds the right network, it isn't difficult to find the right machine itself, but the packet needs to find the right network first. Now, how does the packet go through the right or the best path in this network of networks? There's actually a common protocol that's often used in finding the best paths across the internet. And this protocol is called the Border Gateway Protocol or BGP, right? Here's an example of a bunch of networks connected to each other, right? A machine in this network, A, needs to make a request to this machine in network, C. How does it know how to route that information? Is there like a central global router which finds the best route for it? Well, no. The way BGP works is that each network is autonomous, okay? They call, they're called autonomous systems or AS. The autonomous system can make a decision for itself, right? The networks talk to each other and each network shares with its peers what it can route to and what it cannot route to, okay? So network A would have talked to network B before and found out that it can reach network C in these many hops because either network B has been configured to say that it can reach a certain point with a certain number of hops, or it has been told by some other network that that can reach there in a certain number of hops, right? So now let's say network A has also talked to network D and found that it can reach network C in three hops. Now A makes the smart decision to go to C via B since it's shorter. Fairly simple, right? So here's the Wikipedia definition of BGP, all right, Border Gateway Protocol, is a standardized exterior gateway protocol designed to exchange routing and reachability information among autonomous systems on the internet, right? It makes routing decisions based on paths, network policies, or rule sets configured by a network administrator. There's a lot more to BGP, of course, and I'm just skimming the details here. Honestly, I'm not a network expert, so if you are, please share more details in the comments. But anyway, you don't have to know much about BGP, right? This should be enough for this discussion. We're gonna move on. So what exactly did Cloudflare mess up? It was in the way it advertised the routing, okay? Remember, a route is possible only if a network advertises it, okay? So something like a network saying, okay, if you are from this IP, or rather this IP with a certain prefix, you go here. If you are from an IP with this other prefix, you go there and so on, right? This prefix of IP can actually mean and indicate where the user is coming from geographically, okay? So here are some policies that can be set on a network, right? So IP prefix, let's say ABC, indicating the users from uh, Mumbai go to this set of hosts, right? If IP prefix DEF indicate the user is from Singapore, go to this other route, which is nearer. If IP prefix GHI, this indicates the user is from, I don't know, Australia or something. So this uh, for those users, there's, you know, there's no short way out here, no short route, so you gotta reject it or something like that. So these are routes or policies 
that these autonomous systems can come with, okay? So BGP has this thing called a policy evaluator, okay? So what it does is actually goes through these list of policies and then decides what peers are available and where it needs to be routed, okay? Now this is where Cloudflare messed up. They just messed up the order. So here's the thing, Cloudflare, they were doing some changes, some improvement, and this is what one of their changes looked like. I literally pulled this up from their blog post. This is a diff, and uh, the newly added lines, and as with any diff, the newly added lines have the plus in front of them, and uh, the reordered lines have this exclamation point in the front of them, right? The problematic line is actually this one. This line needs to actually be below. Okay, so this is declaring all the policies in order, right? If there's the IP prefix, then these are the peers. If this is the IP prefix, these are the peers and so on, right? At the end, nothing matches, right? You kind of need like a catch all to say, okay, if none of these match, I'm gonna have to reject everything, right? There's a line that rejects everything else that doesn't match in the lines above. Now, what's this line doing here? It's above these two lines, right? So whatever peers are being advertised in these two lines will never get access because by the time the BCP policy evaluator comes to this line, it's going like, okay, I'm gonna reject everything from now on, right? So you might look at this and go, well, come on, there's just two of these lines that are bypassed here. The others at the top are still there, right? About this reject line. So what's, what's the big deal about it? Well, it turns out Cloudflare was working on improvements for infrastructure for the most critical high traffic areas, all right? And as a result of this change, this literally affected the highest traffic geographies for Cloudflare, right? So cities like Chicago, London, Mumbai, LA, Madrid, Singapore, Sydney, this list goes on, right? All those users got a 503 error instead of the static assets that they wanted to load. What's worse, this change actually locked the Cloudflare engineers themselves from being able to access these locations. So they had to do backup procedures in order to get to uh, these locations and actually revert them, right? Meanwhile, their traffic hit a dip that I would say it's closer to like 50% of their overall traffic, right? So when this happened, they soon started a rollback and the traffic soon recovered a little more gradually, right? This incident was formally open at around 6.32 UTC and it was formally closed at 8 UTC, all right? Now, when I heard this, I had a bunch of questions and I'll share them here and I'll share what I learned because you might have these questions too. First, how does a change like this make it to production, right? Isn't it peer reviewed? What happened to code reviews? They are supposed to cache things like this, right? Well, this is actually the real lapse in my opinion, okay? The blog post, if you look at the blog post, it says that it was code reviewed, but then there were so many changes that this one line change got lost in all the other things that were going on, right? The blog post even kind of defends this by posting this large diff of changes and then goes to see, see, seems like nothing's going on. Well, hang on reader, let me zoom into this one line. See how hard it is to catch this? Well. In my opinion, that's, I think, a bit of a cop-out, right? If the change is big, then maybe they should have broken the diff into smaller, more manageable pieces. You can still roll out the change together and as one, but then break the changes, the code changes themselves into smaller PRs, smaller reviews, maybe? I think that could have been fixed, and I think it's a bit of a lapse on Cloudflare's part. One other question that some people have asked is, why did the fallback mechanism not route to the main website? Okay, we learned that CDNs are just geographical copies of static files. So, okay, we had an issue, Cloudflare was down. So why not redirect requests back to wherever the original file was hosted, right? When Cloudflare was down, why not just send them to the main copy, right? Well, Cloudflare doesn't do this because it kind of gives away the source IP of these assets, right? When you use Cloudflare, your server IP is actually hidden from the users, right? What they're gonna see is the Cloudflare IPs. Now, let's say the fallback in such cases redirects to your actual IP. What happens? Remember I mentioned how Cloudflare protects against denial of service attacks, right? It can only do that if the attacker is attacking the Cloudflare servers. If an attacker gets to know your IP, and then slams your servers with DDoS attacks, there's nothing Cloudflare can do, right? Uh, and also, you don't have, you might not have the capacity to handle 
real time load, right? Cloudflare has been handling that traffic for you. Now, if all that traffic comes and hits your servers, you might not be able to handle it. You might end up having an issue on your end, right? And rather than have all these different servers have these issues, you'd rather have the issue look, be localized to Cloudflare itself, right? So this is the reason why there isn't a fallback option to route traffic back to the main origin servers, all right? Another question is, well, didn't they test this change? Why didn't they catch this before? Well, again, they did roll this out gradually, right? And test every step of the way. But as with most testing, you usually test the least impacted paths first, right? You wanna make sure that things work and it's okay if it were to break. So you test the least impacted paths and then you leave the more critical parts for later, right? To be deployed at the end. And this is what happened, right? The problem was with the more critical parts. Uh, and then of course there are ways you can change this to make the testing process give out like early warnings for the critical pathways as well, even before they roll it out. Uh, they can do this either through process improvements or test automation or both. So this is actually what Cloudflare has promised they will do in the follow-up actions. Now, how will they do that? Whether or not it works, I guess we'll see. The one last thing I wanna call out is this line from the blog post, which talks about how when the revert changes part was complete, right? Here's what it reads, right? It says at 7.42, the UTC time, the last of the reverts has been completed. This was delayed as network engineers walked over each other's changes, reverting the previous reverts, causing the problems to reappear sporadically, okay? First of all, I'll admire the guts it took for Cloudflare to admit this and put it in the outage report. Um, but someone I know uh, kind of looked at it and commented how, you know, this is, this is very unprofessional, right? How can, you know, engineers override each other's changes? Uh, but to be honest, this is a very relatable thing, right? This has happened quite a few times in my experience as well, especially when dealing with production outages. You see, what happens is, uh, when you're dealing with a major production outage, right, and everything is down, people usually tend to hurry a fix and cut corners and not follow all the processes. It's like when everything is literally down, you can't do anything to make it worse, right? So anything goes. Well, it turns out you can always step on someone else who's working on fixing the same problem. So it is, it is a bit of a tricky time. Uh, you obviously don't want to be too process oriented in the middle of an outage, but at the same time, you can't afford to throw all caution to the wind, even if you think that you can't possibly make things worse, right? It's all about communication and having good leadership at the time. So it's something for us to think about. So that's the Cloudflare outage and how one line of code change, literally the position of the line, not even the line, right? It's the position of a line uh, brought down like half of the world's traffic or something crazy like that. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Like or comment to let the YouTube algorithm know. Just comment something. And um, here's another video that you'd probably like to watch next.